Bear Don Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the designer, Courtney Cronin in the building. And we got to talk about are some of these expectations getting a little wild? And I listen, I know I'm a Bears fan. I'm gonna, I'm hyped too. I mean, upcoming season, there's a weapons everywhere we look. There's a top defense that's seemingly on the other side, but are we taking it a little bit too far? We got to get Courtney's insight on that and more coming on today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a five-star review. Y'all know what to do. Courtney, how's it going? How, how are you today? I'm good. It's, you know, we're we're in the month of April, which is great because we're within striking distance of the draft. I know there were moments where it felt like this month would never come, but now as, as quiet as it is, Within the NFL, it's not just the Bears, but as quiet as it is, it's team like during the time where teams are doing their final draft prep now in the thick of top 30 visits, which this is the week that Caleb Williams, along with some other top prospects, are gonna be at Hallis Hall. It's still, you know, it's the race to the finish line is here. It feels slow, but I promise you, April 25th is gonna be here like before we know it. Oh yeah. It's it's going to be one of those months where the mock drafts are going to be flying. People are going to lose their minds. And uh, it will be a much less uh, 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 visceral month than uh, last month was. Like, I think that's the funniest part about all of this. Last year at this time, the mock draft season was when we were all idiots. And uh, this year at this time, it was literally before we even got near any of the draft <laughs> stuff. So uh, at least it seems like things will be calming down a little bit coming up here. Uh, I got to tell you guys, uh, before we jump into this show, it's brought to you by the Hard Rock Casino in Northern Indiana, Las Vegas style gaming, just 30 minutes from Soldier Field, exit six right off of I-80-94. Let's jump into some of these expectations that we're seeing a lot on Twitter, Courtney, and I'm, I'm not going to say I disagree some of these, I guess I kind of disagree with, but but there's some in here that I think should be expectations. And let's start it off with the wins expectation. A lot of Bears fans feel that the expectation for this team this season should be a 10-win season. You should still be able to move forward with the weapons you've added, the defense that is already in place. What are your thoughts win-wise on what the expectation and what kind of pressure should be on Matt Eberflus and his team? Definite improvement from last year. Otherwise, I don't think that they continue on with the staff that's in place. Very clearly, if you go back to January when Kevin Warren talked uh, during the season-ending press conference, he talked about how pivotal year three was, that he pulled back on his experience with the St. Louis Rams, that year three after two years of a rebuild. like That's the year where you really start to capitalize on the progress you've made, but also then like go in a completely different direction, like in a good way, like an upward direction with the progress that that should be the year that you take the next step. Like I always hear like, and I see these win totals and I think I saw recently a win total for Chicago was projected at eight and a half wins. And there's going to be some who look at that and say they were seven and 10 last year. Shouldn't they, shouldn't that be like nine wins? Shouldn't that be 10 wins? you got to learn to crawl before you walk, before you run. And I do think that this team now is in position to go from the crawling phase to standing up to start, you know, getting in stride, if I'm using that running analogy. But you can't, I don't think it's safe or smart to project that this team all of a sudden goes to winning the division, especially considering the construction of the division elsewhere, or being a team that's going to make a deep playoff push. Like, why don't we like wait till they get to the playoffs first before we start talking about what type of playoff team they can be. Now, the way that this roster is constructed where they've cleared the deck, a new quarterback's coming in and he's coming into a really, you know, a really improved team with a lot of good pieces. Pieces You can always tell like teams that are good or most times, um, have they paid players? Have they paid young players? Have yeah. they paid guys who they, you can point to them being the cornerstone pieces of this franchise. There's a handful of them already. There's Jalen Johnson who just got paid. There's Montez Sweat who got paid before he ever played a down to football for the bears. There's, um, you know, Tremaine Edmonds who they brought in in free agency last year, they paid him. That's three on the defensive side alone. And then on the offensive side, DJ Moore is going to get an extension at some point. Like, you know, I think his contract is, uh, it's up through it's up in 2025, 
Um, but when Ryan Poles talked last week about the order in which he does extensions, I think you and I talked about this. Like he said, he wants to be intentional with the timing. When I asked him about Keenan Allen, you know, I think he's referring to DJ Moore in that too, where DJ is in a position that he has, he, he played tremendous football last year. He's probably going to be one of those next cornerstone pieces because he's like contractually, like the con contract reflecting that. So right. I say all that to say you're bringing a quarterback into a team that has that, which means it's a team on the rise. But when I hear 10 wins, I caution people like to go from seven to 10, a three win margin. That's a lot. Like, of course, you can look back at last season and say that there were three games a team should have won because they blew double digit leads in the in, you know, late in the game in the fourth quarter. Could that have been a 10 win team last year? Probably not, because that also takes out like why they got to that point where they were losing those games, which was struggling quarterback play. Well, that that has been eliminated or at least that's changed because you're moving in a different direction at the position. And, you know, the changes they made defensively to make sure that those those things did not happen um, past, you know, the time that Montez Sweat got here. Like you can base your win projections. I think a safe place to do it is on the second half of the season to the end to what this team showed you. And then the expectation that the new players coming in at wide receiver, at quarterback, um, the new center that they're going to have certainly on the defensive side of the ball too, what they do with their pass rush, like all of those things, like how much of a, you know, how, how much does that count towards wins this season? Are they, are they significant enough upgrades to where you think that all of those things collectively yield a win versus a loss in games? And you can factor in the schedule, all of that. I don't know. I feel like 10 is probably too high right now, but there were people last year, Pat, who said that this was a nine win team. Like I, I think the over under ended up closing before the season started at five and a half. And I had them as a six win team. Now they were seven and 10, so it wasn't that far off, but right. it's safer to, you know, there's still unknowns about this team. How is Caleb Williams going to look in his rookie season? Is he going to look like Bryce Young? Is he going to look like CJ Stroud? That's what we're going off of from last year. Does it even have to be that stark of a, of a difference between the two quarterbacks? Like all of those things, end up like you you can make a projection right now but i don't think that it would be a tr you know a true projection that you can really like take to the bank until you see what the bears do like when all the moves are done and obviously a roster is never done but like when the major moves are done including quarterback and then what everybody else in the division does in the draft and how that changes like that the landscape of their rosters because minnesota needs to get a quarterback we know that detroit and, and green bay are good in that department Minnesota's in the same position as the Bears, where they've got to get somebody in there to be just to be able to contend in this division. Because now the NFC North is is a place where if you don't have a quarterback, you might as well get lost because there's some really good quarterback play that's happening here, and that's a very big indicator of future success for teams. Yeah, and I think the the part to me that that stands out with the win expectation on this team is something that you said in there, right? Is you had them projected as a six win team. I think I had them projected as an eight win team. Um, but it kind of felt it, it, there's a difference in feeling with it, right? When you see how they end the season, mm -hmm. they end up as a seven win team, but it felt like they could have been and should have been an eight or nine win team versus in previous seasons where they've been eight win teams. It was like, you probably should have been a six win sure. team, but like, sure. uh, so it feels like you're moving in the right direction. I think that's why we see so much optimism around this team. And I've said, <clears throat> excuse me, I've said this on the pod a couple of times. My expectations are heightened because even looking at the C.J. Stroud scenario where C.J. Stroud's an anomaly comes in with Tank Dell, immediately has an impact. They go out there. The Houston team looks phenomenal in a year that everybody expected them to be losers. The Bears, in theory, at least on paper right now, have more than what C.J. Stroud had yep. to work with last year. And so I do think that there is this the the biggest fear for most people is is Shane Waldron going to work out is Caleb going to work out and again I keep saying this it seems like a situation where you've got enough you've got enough pieces in place that if there is a struggle out of the starting gate from kind of getting on point you always can just say 
let's hand the football off to DeAndre Swift mm-hmm. here. Let's let's check down to Cole Komet here. Let's let's play it safe until we can get on the same page and then start dominating downfield. Yeah. No, I mean that those are all factors that they have to consider. That's still an unknown. Like, yeah. you know, they hired Luke Getze two years ago when they brought in a new staff, and that was supposed to be, you know, what helped Justin Fields then make the jump in his second season. And that didn't consider at the time. I, I don't think anybody, like you're going back, like and looking at like, okay, new offensive coordinator, what were the expectations like in the preseason, which we are in now versus, you know, when reality sets in, when week one hits, I don't think they were that high, but I also think that more people were expecting bigger things because oftentimes we equate change to something better coming through the door, which doesn't always happen, right. but you'd be wise to think that the bears made decisions on personnel, made decisions on the coaching staff based on the belief that those decisions would yield an upgrade in certain departments. Whereas if you, if you felt like things were good as is and could, could only be better with more time spent, that's why they kept Matt Eberflus. They said, okay, they're on the cusp of something. Look at how they started. Look at how they finished. That's the coach that they trust to get this team past seven wins and maybe to nine wins, maybe to 10 wins. Um, I still think that you don't make those decisions in mind with, okay, we have to hit a certain win total. It's just that if it's anything lower than seven wins next season, it's probably chalked up as a loss uh, on the investment, not a return on the investment. And that is that does have to consider like what it's like for a, you know, a team that has a lot of new pieces you know, how those pieces are going to gel together. But this is also a team that has a lot of, you know, it has the structure and the foundation with a lot of guys already in place. So it should be more of how do these additions complement that versus how do they have to change, how do they change the entire picture? Even when you are changing the, you know, the most important position on the team at quarterback, they're viewing it as the infrastructure that's in place right now will help that quarterback not have to go through some of the same rookie, you know, the same rookie curve that that a lot of young quarterbacks have to go through when they're taken number one overall and they go into a bad team. But, you know, how this offense looks, and we won't know during OTAs how, you know, is Caleb struggling is, you know, I mean, of course you can tell in moments and there were times under the field in the fields era where we knew early on in spring Man, that that kind of looks okay. That, that look, I mean, we could tell. Like, I just go back to 2022, yeah. and I'm not trying to go like revision, like you know, ancient history on you. But like, guys were dropping passes in um, OTAs. <laughs> like, you you could probably tell at that point that that probably wasn't like going to be a great year for the team. But yeah. then you can also tell the good stuff, like when Justin Fields and DJ Moore get together, like April, late April last year was like one of the first OTAs or early May. And by the time that they broke for the summer, like they're both talking about how quickly the chemistry came along. Like you could tell, even though it did take a a while for that to show up, like not until like week five last year, but it was building towards something and they were able to put it together early on. So there's positives you can take away from that. And there's also like, okay, maybe this is a sign of concern, but we all of those things that you mentioned with like the new offense and if things are a struggle, then at least you have Deandre Swift and a strong running game to lean on. That's, that's where they hope they can make up some of that ground, maybe make up some of those wins. If things don't pan out um, seamlessly in, in some respects early on. I think the the thing that I, I really want people to, to realize is it also heavily, heavily ends up on how your schedule falls because sure. There's a lot of ways where, and, and a lot of times we'll see this with young guys, right? They come out and there's that initial burst because nobody has any tape on them. And so, right, if you start off the season with, you know, you're, you're playing Tennessee, Carolina, New England, Detroit or something mm-hmm. like that, right? You can sit there and go, oh, maybe we, we can go like three and one in that stretch. Yeah. If over the next stretch you get a team like Washington, Indianapolis, and Houston, you can have a quarterback that starts off the season really well. Or if over that next stretch you get the Rams, Seattle, and uh, 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 Green Bay, right, you can come back down to earth really quickly. So it also depends on, like, a a 10-win season does go into, okay, how is the season going to fall for this young man in his first year? How's the season going to fall for Shane Waldron in his first year? And are the Bears going to be able to kind of – 
you know, do, are, are they going to have an easy start to the season, difficult finish? Is it going to be up and down all throughout the year? That really kind of lays out how quickly you see uh, uh, a lot of times a guy take that jump or come back down to earth. Yeah, I'm looking at their strength of schedule right now. And so they have a four point four sixty seven. So that's technically um, in terms of like, you know, where they're at, it's like second, I think, in terms of like from least difficult to most difficult. That's let's see here. Chicago Bears. Um, so they're seven and ten last year, four and two finish to end the year. So based on what this should be for them, they're like 29th. So like technically that's I'm like trying to go backwards in order here. It like feels like that's the like fourth or fifth easiest strength of schedule, I guess. Like, um, you know, that's yeah, like it, it Cleveland's got the most difficult. So they're at yeah. point point five four seven. Um, and then it goes all the way to where I just told you it bears like 0.49, whatever. So I guess they'd be like fourth or fifth easiest strength of schedule, but like it's all relative to what you just pointed out. In what order do those games come in? Because we don't won't know that for a month. That's usually they never give you like a direct an exact date that they're going to like launch the schedule until they tell you um like the day that it like the day that it before it comes out. But what we know right now about their opponents is that they have a game that's happening in London next year. So that's not a home game. Yeah. That's a road game for both teams, but that factors into a win or a loss. That's different than like normal circumstances of just having with, you know, the games over here. Um, and you know, their, their schedule, like when you take a look at how many teams finish the year with losing records, not many, like not many. I mean, Carolina, sure. New England, sure. Tennessee, yes. Um, the Commanders, yes. But like even teams that were kind of like in Arizona, so it's like five teams with like clear cut. And like, I'm not talking about like, you know, a, almost 500 finish, like teams that were not good last year and, right. and some by design. But then you have teams like Indianapolis who were like on the cusp of being a seven seed at one point. And we know how Houston finished the year uh like winning the AFC South coming out of nowhere to do that and then of course like where the Vikings are yeah like they were a not so great team at the end of the year and their record reflects it based on where they're drafting but it's also because their quarterback got hurt now you know all of those things will come into play with how we look at this team and when you and I are doing the podcast the day after or the night of the schedule being released how we view that over under total right now of you know, eight and a half and whether it could be more, whether it could be less, because usually the Vegas odds shift at that point yeah. based on how they see teams like the Bears at, you know, 29th. I don't know how you call it. Like they rank 29th in strength of schedule. So is that 29th easiest? 29th? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't get myself confused with this. They're 29th in the well, in like well, the listen, pecking when, order. When you look like, at the teams on the schedule, I'm not going to say it's 29th hardest in Vegas right now. I mean, you're talking about. Okay, it's like 29th easiest. They're going yeah. to like worst or like hardest schedules the Browns. Let me pull this thing up again. Hardest schedules the Browns. And I think the Saints technically have the easiest strength of schedule. Yeah. Are they 32nd? Yeah, they're no. Um, no, yeah, they are 32nd right now. So like that is, but like, I don't know. I, I find strength of schedule in some years it works out like where you can be like, oh yeah, that was a legit stat that, that ended up foreshadowing their future. Other times it's like, you know, there's attrition, there's roster turnover, there's injuries that have to be accounted for that stuff like strength of schedule, frankly, can't account for. Yeah, it, it, it changes week by week. Like, it's like, yeah. this is the most difficult strength of schedule in the NFL. And then, you know, two of the quarterbacks that are starting on the team go down and you just go, oh. Oh, no, it's not all that difficult anymore. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to worry about two major yeah. pieces coming up. So, yeah, strength of schedule – that's that's always my favorite stat in almost every sport. In basketball, it's literally my favorite because it never works. Mm -hmm. like, it's like the Bulls have the easiest. I schedule think it's harder to, like, and especially in the sport where you have like, you know, eighty-two games. It's you know, it's much harder to project there over the course of a season that goes from late October through April yeah. than it is over a 17 game stretch. Yeah. I, 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 I don't understand how they factor those things in. And I know it's based on, there's a formula for it. Like, especially in NBA, like it's based on win loss um, record, home games, road games, very similar to the NFL schedule, but I feel like it's more difficult to do in the NBA and, and, you know, especially like baseball too, when you're playing that many games. 
Oh, for sure. The the Bulls had like the the I think the fifth easiest schedule going out of the All Star break before mm-hmm. it ended up. And then all of a sudden the Knicks went on a run and now it's like one of the the fifth hardest schedules. And it's like, oh, well, you know, that changed quickly. So it's at least in football, you kind of it takes major factors for it to shift. We'll say that. Uh, Let's get to our road to the draft. It's brought to you by Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. Another one of what I believe the beliefs around Caleb Williams as he gets drafted here. If she, if the Chicago Bears take him number one overall, we're doing the caveat thing, but we're we're expecting it here. Um, is that Caleb Williams is not only in a great circumstance, but he should be in the best circumstances to win Rookie of the Year. Now, you got to ball out a little bit to win Rookie of the Year, but if you are the quarterback, it does slant more in your favor. Do you mm-hmm. feel like the expectation on Caleb Williams because of the team he's coming into should be that he wins Rookie of the Year? Yes, for a number of reasons. So the team he's coming into, first off, sets him up in a much better situation than what Bryce Young went to the last number one overall pick. And it's, you know, if you go back to 2022 rookie offensive rookie of the year, Garrett Wilson won that on a team that didn't win a lot of games. CJ Stroud won it on a team last year on a team that won 10 games. So it's, there's no real exact science to it. I think certainly how the rookies play, like if you have rookies that are just lighting it up, which we have not seen from rookie quarterbacks like on a consistent basis the way that C.J. Stroud did last year. But if you've got rookies dueling back and forth um, throughout the season and putting up big numbers, then you have more of a competition. But like in 2022, when it was Kenny Pickett as one of the top quarterbacks that came out of that yeah. year's draft class um, and, you know, Malik Willis came out of that year's draft class, like there's, the, the pickings were so slim that – it made sense that a receiver win it that year. Um, but like this year, the strength of the quarterback class and the and the places that those those players are going to go to, I think you could make a case for several of them. Now, like let's think about number two and number three. Washington and like all of the changes that they've made, and we expect like either you know, Jaden Daniels, um, Drake May, yeah. maybe JJ McCarthy, if you buy into that hype, like is a quarterback there going into a good situation, like a better situation than it was, but they also still like have undergone some pretty significant changes in Washington. And let me, yeah. like their, their win total right now is the a, they have not won had a winning season since 2015. Their win total right now is six and a half, like and not basing it all on that. But I think it's a good point, like a good starting point to determine, can this quarterback be, the difference between what the projection is now and flipping that projection on its head. CJ Stroud was that guy last year for the Houston yeah. Texans. That doesn't happen often though. And think about how many injuries there were last year. Um, you know, like with Anthony Richardson kind of, you know, taking himself out of the mix four or five weeks into the season, like because of that. And he was on the bench. He was, you know, on injured reserve the rest of the year. So the pickings for like, it was a no brainer that CJ Stroud got it, but like, who was his best competition outside of that for offensive rookie of the year? Yeah. I like, I really can't think of anybody else. So I, oh. I, I think for the bears in the situation that they're in, haven't had a winning season since. Well, two- I would, I would say it would be the guy he was throwing the football to probably right. Tank Dell is probably sure. the other one that you would, you would put up in there. I'm trying to think like what the odds were at one point, like if he was ever like really on the short list of odds, Tank Dell, that is. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, are there rookie running backs across the league? You know, Bijan maybe Bijan, probably was the one Bijan that Robinson may, like with this, he was never in the mix, but like Zach Charbonnet made a case yeah. for at least being like one of, you know, in the mix of like best rookie running back, but like overall, so I don't here's know. Here's your nominees like, last year. Stroud, Laporta, Yep. Laporta's a good one. Jameer Gibbs mm-hmm. on there. Puka Nakua was on that list. And then Bijan Robinson. Mm-hmm. 
And like, CJ think, Stroud ended up winning that. I feel like Puka, just because of the rookie receiving record um, and like how, you know, what the records that he broke for the Rams and like doing what, you know, topping what Cooper Cup did a couple of years ago, like that's really impressive for a team that no one saw climbing their way to seven, 10 wins. Um, but bringing it back to Caleb, like you got to think about the competition he'll be going up against for that award in specific. So yeah. right now it's at least like the top three quarterbacks, but then you like look sort through that and you think, what are the Patriots going to be? Whether it's Drake may, whether it's JJ uh, McCarthy, yeah. what are they going to look like? Are they in, in a mode right now where they're trying to, it still might take them a year or two to get to a place where they're comfortable with this roster, like in, in trying to do what the Bears did, because they're still going, they're going through a rebuild on their own, new coaching staff, new front office. Um, they signed Jacoby Brissett as a bridge quarterback. Like, do you expect that the quarterback there who will be a rookie if they go that route, which we all think that they will, um, is is that going to be somebody who's in the running right away? Like the infrastructure around the player who wins offensive rookie of the year matters like let's bring up yeah. puka nakul who was throwing in the ball matthew stafford in a year where absolutely he had a great comeback from um you know the injury he sustained the previous year i think he only missed like one game last year like that stuff matters who is caleb williams throwing the ball to seasoned veteran receivers who instantly make his job easier than some, you know, a rookie who has never done it at this level or a first year player, first year starter. So all of those things matter and factor into where he, where he's at right now. But in terms of the odds, I don't think that that should surprise anybody that he's way up there for offensive rookie of the year, considering the situation he's going into first off his own raw talent alone um, and how that raw talent is supposed to project at the NFL level, but the situation he's going into and the players that are around him, where it would be a lot different if he was going to a team that did not have the finish that the Bears did over the final six games. Yeah, and and I'll say this: I've, while we were talking here, I've, I've <laughs> I kind of went back through the last uh, ten years here of offensive rookie of the years, and I will say there's a clear cut correlation with good quarterback or bad mm -hmm. quarterback based yeah. on another I mean, position. Trevor, Trevor Lawrence. Trevor yeah. Lawrence, like, I mean, he was putting up pretty big numbers as a rookie um, and didn't win. Herbert won it the year before. No, it was Joe Burrow. Or, no, Herbert won it the Garrett, year before. Garrett Wilson won 2022. Jamar Chase won 2021. One. Uh, Herbert won it 2020. Uh, 19 is Kyler Murray. 18 right. is Saquon Barkley. 17, Alvin Kamara. But, I mean, as you go Oh, yeah, that's through, right. Trevor Lawrence didn't win it because of um, because of Jamar Chase that season. And, yeah. you know, the, that year, obviously, they um they went to the Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. So, yeah. <laughs> but I feel like, if I remember correctly on that, Trevor Lawrence was, like, he was number two, and in, in, he finished, like, top two. But he also, I mean, his rookie season, all that he overcame that year to put up some pretty significant numbers – like put him very much in the mix there at the end of the year. Yeah, no, for sure. It's just, I think that it's one of those things that the season also was uh, one where Jamar Chase was a clear cut reason why all of a sudden the Bengals were a top tier team versus Trevor Lawrence, who, yeah, he put up some decent numbers his rookie year, but you, you kind of looked at it and said, yeah, but they suck. Um, now that mm -hmm. went to a lot of other things that happened sure, in absolutely. Jacksonville that year. I'm not putting that on Trevor Lawrence, but um, I just I th there is kind of this like if you don't see elite quarterback numbers, that's yeah. usually the only time somebody and I don't even know. Yeah, well, I don't even know if I can say elite right because Kyler's first year, good year. Not elite quarterback numbers, but maybe what you kind of expected from him as a rookie. They made the if, playoffs that year, but they right. also like, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. And I mean, things like interceptions matter. Yeah, Trevor yeah. Lawrence threw for 3,600 yards, but he also threw 12 touchdowns to 17 interceptions. So 17 yeah. were a league high. So, of course, like factoring all those things. Like if Caleb comes here and can you imagine, like one thing I always have the thought about, you know, the Bears never had a 4,000 yard passer. His in, rookie year. Can you imagine if he does as a rookie? Does that, how, do like, no, but like seriously, how do you think that factors into the conversation of like the voters who are voting on rookie of the year? They're gonna be like, hey, yeah. you, like even if the team is seven and ten again and he does that, hey, you've you've already done something that literally nobody else has ever been able to do in franchise history. How wild that would, would that be? be? Yo, yo, I I'm not gonna lie to you. First off, 
I can't wait to see what my DMs are littered with if Caleb Williams throws 4,000 yards in his first year. And I hope to God he does. But can you imagine everything that we've been through as Bears fans? And in the first year, I mean, a 4,000-yard passer, now touchdown to interception ratio does matter, Mm -hmm. but a 4,000-yard passer in year one, and it's a rookie, he's the best quarterback in your history, right? Like, he instantly vaults to number one, right? Like, I guess you can say McMahon. I guess, I guess of course, Luckman, but, like, who – I don't, like – And some, will, some will still becomes say, the number one guy. Some, some will still say Jay Cutler. Um, based Cutty. on – And I think that that's a hard thing because of the, like, longevity at the position. Like, when you're saying, like, best – statistically speaking, the stats yeah. would tell you one thing, but in terms of big picture – there will, you know, it's, it's one year versus the body of work. And I don't, I feel like that would be pre, too premature to like put him in that conversation. But if the numbers tell you something that no one else has done, you can't ignore that. You can't <laughs> ignore that. Cause like we had, did we not have the same conversation about DJ Moore before he came to Chicago? Who said he's the best receiver that the bears have ever had. Yeah. And he hasn't played a down yet. Then yep. there's then there's people jumping out of the woodwork being like, what about Alshon Jeffrey? What about Brandon Marshall? Brandon Marshall. Um, you know, what about the guys who did it in Chicago? You know, one of whom had an all pro season, both of whom had like, you know, multiple Pro Bowl seasons. But like that's the numbers tell a story that I just don't think can be ignored. But even now, like I mean, this is a good conversation. I think like, you know, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. Like, would you consider DJ Moore the best receiver in Bears history? I would say because the Bears didn't end up making the playoffs, you're probably still. He could be. It's just like when you base it off. He's in the conversation for it, but like it's tough for me to put you above guys that put up big numbers and did kind of the same thing, Mm -hmm. right? Like B. Marsh put up, what do you have, 1,500 yards that year? Or was that Alshon? One of them had a ridiculous uh, uh, season. Well, they both had a ridiculous season that year. But. you 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 look at that and yeah they don't end up making the playoffs but like that's kind of what DJ Moore just did but I'll say as far as a um the pure ability like the sure. the combination of speed and ability to catch the football and like I would say I'd probably yeah he had a 1500 yard season yeah no I'm probably still gonna have and I had DJ Moore coming in as the best I probably still got B Marsh above because we didn't make the playoffs. You're having the same mm-hmm. conversation. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think looking at someone's career, you know, their career numbers when they're coming to a place. And like, I think, yeah. I think that was a solid argument that, you know, yeah. simply pointing out a fact that he had more receiving yards than anybody else did in their entire bears career before he even played here. But that's, you know, if Caleb gets there, his rookie year where he throws for 4,000 yards. And I feel like you got, again, got a, crawl before you can start walking before you can start running like a lot of things outside of his control are going to factor into whether he does that whether it's play calling whether it's the design of the offense whether it's um you know the offensive line and what we think is taking another step towards being a good unit um how that helps him as a rookie and the in the weapons he has around him but there's a lot there that is beyond the control of one player but if he gets there when you and I are podcasting, Listen. like if that happens, then we're are then we are talking. I think pretty significantly about him having rookie of the year locked up. Uh, rookie of the year for sure. I think now the conversation, like I, I think we stumbled onto a great conversation. Can the expectations for Caleb be best quarterback in Bears history? Like if wow. he puts up twenty four and twelve, like Mitch touchdown to interception ratio with four thousand yards, I'm I'm side eyeing a little bit. I'm like, <laughs> hey, we. This this may get wild here. You want you think this offseason was wild. I can't wait for the Incredible. Jay Cutler debates next year. Uh let's keep this thing moving along. Appreciate you guys for tuning in and showing love. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page. Let us know can Caleb Williams become the best quarterback in Chicago Bears history if he puts up 4000 plus yards this season. Of course, winning being the caveat and all of that. Mm-hmm. Let us know in the comments below. Um I guess off of that, right, we've seen a lot of expectations because of the pieces that have been put together, because of uh, uh, a lot of the moves that Ryan Poles has made this offseason, that this Bears team should be guaranteed to be a top 10 offense this year. Courtney, is that expectation fair for the Chicago Bears right now? 
I always like to, you know, go the like the side of temper expectations just a little bit until you see how those pieces all fit together. Yeah. But, you know, this is an offense that was 27th in passing last year, second in rushing. Finding a way to first close the gap between those two is priority number one if they want to be a top 10 offense. If you're looking at it on paper, do they have a skill group that can rival other teams' skill groups, the skill groups of top 10 offenses? Sure, they do. When you have two really good receivers in DJ Moore and Keenan Allen, experienced yeah. veteran receivers who make quarterbacks better, that should instantly put you in a category where you're like, yeah, this offense is passing offense, not going to be 27th next year. The way that the offensive line finished off the year versus how it started, where you had a rookie right tackle learning, you know, learning this job on, you know, by trial by fire. And now that you have him with Darnell Wright with a year under his belt, Braxton Jones with two years under his belt, and who knows if they end up drafting a tackle at some point, what that looks like. But you also have Tevin Jenkins, who if you're thinking, okay, experience is one thing, and he's very, very experienced, and he's good at that, but, like, can he stay healthy? Nate right. Davis, and then the change at center. That should be a unit that's at least top 15 in pass protection. So – like those things factored in on top of, you know, DeAndre Swift coming off a, a career year, you can talk yourself into believing and expecting that they will be a top 10 offense. I think a safer place to put this group right now as they try to figure out what does the run game look like now that Justin Fields is not here, that he's not like the biggest part of the run game, yeah. which is going to be different because I venture to guess it's probably not going to Caleb Caleb's arm talent is it's stronger than what Justin Fields was coming in. That's just, that's just simply a fact. So that's what they're going to lean on him more to produce instead of, you know, instead of what we saw the last couple of years of Justin Fields still making those, you know, incredible like splash plays with his legs. Yeah. So how does that, like, are they top eight or top nine as a rushing team? Are they a top five unit still? Like what that looks like, I think will determine where we rank them, but I think it's probably safer to say right now, like top 12, top 13 offense, but there's still the unknowns that put them in that category of, okay, you hope all these pieces are going to to play out the way that you expect when you made these moves, because you consider them upgrades. Otherwise you wouldn't have made those moves. Um, and I think if you take a look at where Seattle was the last couple of years, not much different than the bears. Does that yeah. mean that the system can't translate to Chicago and, look different here and work here better than it did in Seattle. No, it doesn't mean that. I think that that very well could happen. And I don't think that Shane Waldron um, takes this job if he doesn't feel that the weapons that the bears will have at, at his disposal to utilize in the quarterback situation that he was going to be able to be a part of would not yield an offense that's better than like, you know, the mid twenties. So all of that, I think I look at and I say, okay, like let's start at like top 12, top 13, top 14, 15 offense instead of automatically going into top 10. Because if you're looking at top 10 offenses right now, based on where teams finished last year, I think you're still thinking that the Kansas City Chiefs, despite how they ended, yeah. um, or despite how the season went for them, look, they just ended with another Super Bowl win because of their quarterback, first and foremost. Like, you're looking at where the Bengals are, where the Buffalo Bills are, where the Baltimore Ravens are, where, you know, there's like, you know, the, the Detroit, um, you know, there's like six or seven other teams that are clear cut favorites ahead of the Bears to finish in like whatever the rankings would be for one through 10. But right. just outside the top 10, I think is absolutely a fair expectation. I think. See, to me, this is one where I feel like the Bears should be able to finish as a top 10 offense scoring-wise, right? Because scoring-wise, your your number 10 offense last year is the Cleveland Browns. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They, they scored 23 points a game. I would hope that with all of the changes that you've made, you would be able to score a little, at least in that range, right? You would able be able to be able to muster two to three touchdowns a game from your offense, not even counting what your defense is able sure. to give you. Um, I, I don't think that top 10 is a crazy bar I to have for the Chicago Bears heading into next season, just because when you kind of look at some of those teams, at least scoring-wise, right, like you, you start to see some, like the Saints are in there. 
uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> as far as scoring points last year, right? They they tied with the Cleveland Browns. Like, like not this and, and offense should be up with some of the rule changes that they've made this season. We know it's gonna take a little bit to adjust to some of those rules, but I just feel like that's not a crazy expectation just because the teams ahead of us, I don't think that we would think of as offensive teams. Heck, and some of these teams lost their quarterback. Remember, the Colts are in there as well mm-hmm. as far as just scoring points. And they lost Anthony Richardson like five games into the season. Yeah, no, and I mean, like where the Bears were last year. So they scored 37 offensive touchdowns, like the yeah. league leaders and teams that I even forgot to mention. Of course, let's not forget Dallas. Let's not forget, oh, yeah. um, you know, the Dolphins in their high-powered offense, the 49ers. 49ers in, my, in Miami – led the league with 61 touchdowns last year in the gap between where they were as like, you know, the number one and number two offense jockeying for positioning all season long and where the bears were, that's one to t- one or two to basically 20. Yeah. Should they be a top 10 offense based on all of the, you know, contributions that you expect from the new players, but also the players who have been here like DJ Moore, um, like the, you know, the, how they're planning to use the running back room. All of those things should factor into a, a unit that is vastly improved from where they were a year ago, but the one thing that's going to be really good for Caleb Williams is that he doesn't have to come in here and feel like he's got to score yeah. four touchdowns a game. When you have a defense that is as opportunistic as the Chicago Bears is with all the takeaways and where they finished, you know, tied for the league lead and in interceptions last year, that's going to carry, it's going to take some of the weight off of Caleb Williams and, you know, not have the weight of this franchise on him at all times to feel like we're, man, if we, if the offense isn't humming today, then we're then it's going to be a long day for us because they yeah. know that they can rely on the defense to get them out of certain situations in ways that last year we didn't know at the early part of the season. They showed us towards the end that they can be that group, but like we didn't know that early on. So now that we know that, I think that that's even that even feeds into more of why Will, like Williams is coming to a, coming to a situation that will not require him. Like if 23 points is all you need to put up to be the top 10 offense where the Browns were last year, that should be a feasible mark, no question. But there's all the other things in terms of how many touchdowns per game, right? you know, touchdowns in total, like what, like where your contributions are coming from. Are they coming from the run game or do you have a stable passing offense that's better than 27th in the NFL that – you know, you're not having games where the quarterback's throwing like under 200 in, in 30 yards, like on a consistent basis, then I think you're, or, you know, in a much better spot than than this offense was last year to have yeah. those sorts of projections. No, for sure. And, and that's that's really kind of what it to me, what it all boils down to is just right. Like you look at how close the Bears could have been to being a top 10 offense. And we know people would have beaten their chests if they if they were top 10 in scoring, right? Even with some of the struggles that we saw, okay, you supposedly got better this offseason. You added pieces. And they did. They added some really good pieces in. So mm-hmm. I think that the expectation of top 10 isn't outlandish. I've seen sure. people that are like, you, you, you can't expect them to be amazing right off the bat. Like, you, all, it, I, I think you also bring up a great point when you talk about the defense, right? The Chiefs offense wasn't amazing last year. Correct. The Chiefs offense got a ton of bites at the apple because last year. Defense. The defense put them in great positions. You look at the top of that thing, um, the Dallas is up there. Dallas had a defense that was cooking for a good portion of the season. San mm-hmm. Francisco's at the top there. For Their sure. defense gives Brock Purdy a ton of uh, uh, opportunities to go out there and continue to pile on points, right? Like, I think that. It, it's very understated how much because of how much of an offensive NFL, the NFL is trying to make everything, how important these top defenses still are to you having an elite offense. More mm-hmm. bites at the apple is the best thing in the world, especially for a rookie quarterback. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, you bring up a good point about all of the other, like if you look at the list right now and I just pulled it up, um, you know, Miami's defense, it, it was kind of like they dealt with a lot of injuries yeah, first and you know, foremost, you know. but like that's an offense that, you know, because of the speed that they have of their weapons on the outside, that really factors into why they were able to put up 400 yards a game, yeah. but like 49ers really good defense. Um, number three offense is, is are the lions and the lions had an off had a defense that was all over the freaking place last year, like moments where it's like, wow, they're okay. And then other moments you're like, what the hell was that, Aaron? <laughs> um, but like there's, you know, in the Bills, 
you know, again, like an offense that supports a quarterback to turn the ball over quite a bit to give him more bites at the apple. That's a good thing for any quarterback, regardless of whether you're Josh Allen or a rookie. And the Cowboys, the Ravens, um, the Eagles were in there too, and the Chiefs and Vikings. The rhyme or reason to like good scoring offenses is, you know, how many more chances can you get at the end zone? So being in a spot where he's got a defense that, you know, is playing a cover two shell and is focused on turning the ball over and grabbing takeaways, that's only going to help someone like Caleb. And it's only going to help any of the projections out there of them finishing among the top units in the NFL because the strength of this unit right now like the skill group, I, you know, they haven't had a skill group like this in a, in a while. So that's that's important and it's impressive to see if Caleb Williams can come in here and get that unit to live up to those expectations because that will mean that the quarterback in terms of like the wins over replacement and all of those things, like how many wins can we count on Caleb Williams improving this team? If you're utilizing that talent properly, then it should be a significant jump from where it was. Yeah. No, 100%. Uh, I think this leads into a, a, a great segue for our final one here. Final expectation that we've seen, and one that I do believe that the Bears kind of have in their favor, but the expectation that this defense is elite. The expectation that this is a defense that can carry a team. And I want to bring it in here with the caveat of how the Bears finish the season. Yes, dominated mm-hmm. intercepting the football, Uh, end up going on a run where all of a sudden we're leading the NFL in takeaways at a certain point. But then you kind of look at the end of the season and you see the quarterbacks that you went up against and maybe it raises some red flags coming into this season. Uh, You had Jordan Love who, who didn't have a great showing in that last game burst. You only put up 17 points, but I guess right made you look a little bit silly because your offense couldn't score at all. Uh, the Falcons had was Ritter in at that point, or was that who? I don't even know. Heineke Heineke was starting Mm -hmm. in that one. Uh, you had Kyler Murray, uh, who at that point that offense was going down the drain quickly. You went up against Joe Flacco, he played the Lions in there, good quarterback there. Uh, you had last week versus the Vikings, would have been oh, why can't I think of his name? The Rocket Side, Josh Dobbs, Josh Dobbs, yeah. So, not my point here is. Not a lot of great quarterback play going up against you to finish out the season where we saw that defense being more elite. Do you feel like it's a fair expectation to have high hopes for this defense coming into this season? Yeah, it should be, of course. Like given where they given where they finished last year and what like, you know, the catalyst for this team going four and two in the final six games and the seven and ten finish. Did the offense click in moments? Sure. But when did that improvement really start? It started halfway through the season when Montez Sweat gets here. When, you know, and you can go back and be like, oh, what about that Raiders game? Like when they, you know, had Tyson Bajan at quarterback and Jalen Johnson and two interceptions. You bring up a salient point. Look at who the quarterback was in that game. All the quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah. Like there were, <laughs> if there was any year for them to try to hit the over uh, on win losses, wins and losses, it was last year based on, just how things broke for this team after the first couple weeks of the season. But the catalyst for improvement was how much they improved on the defensive end. When Jalen Johnson started getting the takeaways, when Montez Sweat changed the outlook for this entire defense, when he became the, you know, quote unquote multiplier that Ryan Poles, you know, has chalked him up to be. And the reason that they made that trade, like that stuff is, is the reason that you look at, what this group is. And and if you're looking just at sack numbers, yeah, they were at the bottom of the NFL. And I do think sacks matter. I know that some coaches will tell you, well, they, it doesn't tell the whole story. They are right on that, but like they've got to finish next season way higher than yeah. like, they were last in sacks two years ago. They were like second or third fewest sacks uh, last season. I don't have the number right in front of me, but like their sack percentage, the quarterback hurries, all of those things had an uptick towards the end of the year, but they still probably weren't where like they were affecting the quarterback as much as Matt Eberflus had hoped. So um, they need, like that's why I feel like as it's kind of like segues us into the draft. Like, all right, what about number nine? What are the options there? Is there a chance that they go get an edge rusher there? If they want to improve this defense, they've got to find some, some help on the outside pretty quickly, uh, unless they are so confident that, 
you know, DeMarcus Walker in some combination of whoever they draft, if it is in the later rounds, if it's not a first round pick, if it's not something that they think that they could do at nine or somewhere in between, but they've got to be really confident that they either have veteran help coming in or that like this group is, is so ready to take the next step based on what, you know, they saw from last year, which I think you need to improve the personnel there before you can get to that ex- to expectation. But it's a group that, well, over the second half of the season was a top five defense, right. which if you're just basing it on that and basing it on that, but like what that tells you about like where they're headed, that should be a top five defense this year. And things came along like once, you know, they've got upgrades too. like they, they feel that they've upgraded in terms of versatility and in terms of health and availability with at safety with Kevin Byer. they have a secondary now that feels like it's set. It's solidified. Like they made two of those choices last year when they, when they grabbed Terrell Smith in the fifth round and they got Tyreek Stevenson on day two, like those are not areas where they're like super big question, where there are super big question marks because of the choices that they made and the contributions that they got last year and the year before that. Um, The biggest area of concern right now is the pass rush. If they can improve on that, then I think without a doubt, they will be a top five defense probably from like for the majority of the season, but it's all going to depend on how do they get Montez sweat and that group, some help on the other side. What does the three technique position look like? Is Javon Dexter ready to make significant strides at that position? If he, if he's not, then you've really got to look into, you know, making an upgrade there at some point in the near future, but this group, and what like what they've shown us about the takeaways, about forcing turnovers, about capitalizing off those forced turnovers. If the offense can then carry its, you know, its weight, which it didn't do. Think about how many times in that Detroit game where the defense would come back, get them a turnover, you know, get turn turn the ball over, the offense yeah. would go three and out. That happened quite a bit several times during that sec during that stretch of games at the end of the year, and even the ones in which they lost or the ones in which they didn't score a lot. Like Defense t- turned the ball over quite a bit in Minnesota. The Bears still scored 12 points. Like, you know, it's it, big picture wise. It's on the entire team to get them there, which offense included. But I think the, the defense can give the offense that many opportunities, which is why they're, we're gonna, we will consider them in, you know, top five, um, you know, by the, you know, by this point next year, when we're looking back on it, that should absolutely be it. Yeah. I mean, they, the, to your point, they finished, uh, just ahead of the Carolina Panthers in sacks. Yeah. <laughs> 30 sacks Second. last season. <laughs> Second to last. So that is not uh, where you want to see. And if you can increase the pressure, it's why everybody's talked about going out getting a pass rusher this year opposite Montez Sweat. Absolutely. You can increase that pressure. I think that you really open things up for this defense as far as takeaways, as far as, um, you know, j- just forcing quarterbacks into bad situations. Because here's we, we kind of had this conversation before the pod started, like the list of QBs isn't great that you're going to be facing this year either. Yeah. Like there's some better ones on there. No, but I'm, I mean, I'm looking at it right now. Let me find where I had that window. Yeah. So like Detroit, we know twice that'll be Jared Goff, Green yep. Bay, twice Jordan Love, Minnesota, unknown. Um, Rams, Matthew Stafford, Seattle, yep. I guess it's, Gino? you know, like, I mean, unless something crazy happens, but yeah, that's, Geno Smith, um, Jacksonville, Trevor Lawrence. So he falls into the good category, Tennessee. Does he? What about what? Uh, yeah, I think he does. I think that's fair to say he does. Um, Tennessee's will, will Levis unknown Bryce Ugh. young. Oof, yeah. Hopefully it's better than last year for his sake. It doesn't Patriots, look unknown Kyler Murray with Arizona. I mean, he's still like a, a dynamic threat. Um, and this is supposed to be their year where they get their offense off the ground after kind of taking a back seat last year, which was by design. But Houston, very good quarterback. Indianapolis, unknown with Anthony Richardson. San Francisco, known commodity, good quarterback. And Washington, unknown. So, like, could it play out like last year where there are situations where you have young quarterbacks or just, like, bad quarterback play that you should be able to capitalize on? Potentially. Um, but I... I it, it it doesn't look it Patrick Mahomes isn't on that schedule no. anywhere right now. Lamar Jackson, not on that schedule anywhere right now. Josh Allen, not on that schedule anywhere. Like, Joe Burrow, like the top quarterbacks that you're going against and like, that you think of the when you best think one of, you got is Purdy. Yeah. In turn, like, yeah. 
Am I am I tweaking on that? Probably that's probably the best quarterback. Here, well, I guess I maybe Stroud. Yeah, Stroud. But you know, Jared, Go- Goff. Goff is an interesting one because not to say Goff is not one of the best quarterbacks that you're gonna face, but you know, like when it, when it just feels like a team has your number, like how like Mitch used to always just beat Detroit back in the day. Like mm-hmm. there's something weird about this Bears team where it's just like they just compete really yeah, really well against Detroit. Yeah, and they still haven't really figured it out. Now they end up getting the one win last year. year. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Which I mean, the Bears still have that same problem with Green Bay. So I guess, yeah, that's our trade off right now. Uh, Courtney, we appreciate you coming on this show. Are there any things before we get up out of here that you are expecting from this Bears team to see heading into next season? That's a good one. Um, I, I, I'm zeroing in on the run game because i'm very interested to see how shane waldron utilizes deandre swift because like he kind of had a two-headed monster there in um in in seattle Seattle. kenneth Kenneth walker and zach charbonnet you have three now so like how do you make up the the yards that you will not be getting from the quarterback and i'm not saying caleb williams is going to just like be a pocket quarterback he's not like he's great on broken down plays it's how he makes his bread and butter Right. Um, and I do anticipate he will, you know, contribute to that, but like not to the degree of Justin Fields. So like, I'm curious, like what we're like, the, when I talk about expectations, my expectation for them still being a top 10 rushing offense is, is pretty high, but where does it go? Like, does it go, is it top two? Is it, I mean, it was top two last year. I don't think it's top two again next year, but how, how they make up those yards that they lost is where, you know, that's where I'm looking right now is like it's ha- trying to project that out. Cause frankly, I think it should be top 10, but I think it's probably closer to like seven or eight or nine, maybe. See, I'm trying to calm bears fans down. Cause I fully expect people to be in a rage. Cause I don't think we're going to be running the football much. <laughs> like if they're not that- running the football, it means that there's probably something really good happening yeah. with like the passing offense, which is a good thing. Yeah, see, I, but hope I also so. don't think they bring DeAndre Swift in here if they're not anticipating like leaning heavily on the on the run game. And yes, I know that Shane Waldron. There were moments last year where it felt like Seattle probably could have run the ball more. But I mean, they were bottom five rushing yeah. offense last year. Like, they and that, it, and, like, and that he, they also didn't have a rookie crazy. quarterback. They didn't have a rookie quarterback coming That's in true. where they're expecting. Okay, we've got to take some pressure off this guy. Let's have, let's build a good run game around him. I think yeah. that you know. I, I, I agree with you there. Like, I think maybe the rookie aspect of it maybe has Shane go a little bit more. All right, let's run the football here. I also think that Matt Eberflus is the kind of guy that maybe is going to take a little bit more charge and saying, we need to run the ball. Like, yeah. you got to figure most, this most out. Most defensive co- minded coaches will do that. <laughs> But, hey, we appreciate you guys for tuning in, showing love. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a five-star review. Y'all know what to do. And let us know what your expectations are heading into next season. Which ones are your biggest expectations as well? For Courtney Cronin, I'm Pat the Designer. Back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Bear down. One love. Peace.